Oh, can y'all hear that? <laughs> I like that old song. You know, we hadn't sung some of those songs in several years. There were there were some good ones. Some good ones. Do y'all ever think about that though? When you when you're singing these songs, do you ever think about the life that that person must have? You know, where they? I don't even know who wrote those songs, but I know the same Jesus that's dealing with them, the same one that's dealing with me. And they sat down and wrote the words to those songs, and it, you know, and now we sing them. You know, I think it's just amazing. You know, Wade's always calling me because you know he needs me to help him write these songs. I keep waiting. One day he's gonna he's gonna use some of my that lyrics I give him, but not yet. But uh, anyway, Second Thessalonians. We're gonna finish up our study of Second Thessalonians. I hope you guys have enjoyed. First and Second Thessalonians, of course, if you missed it, if you're new here, uh, I know that a lot of people are not using the Facebook as much anymore, and, and uh, that may be really good for you, and I don't know. I mean, that's whatever floats your boat, right? But we, if you don't want to use Facebook, we do have the YouTube, you know, so you can get on there and subscribe to that. And when you do go on YouTube, click on Playlist, and you can see all the different books that we have recorded for you. You know, all the way back, we've even got Revelation on there, where Pastor Scott Rush, you know, took us through Revelation. Uh, you know, we've got all of these different books that we're studying, and uh, so we want to record them, because many people, you have to go back and listen sometimes. Well, let me go ahead and say, all the time. Because you're not going to remember, the, you know, everything. So you have to go back and just find, I want you to find yourself through the week as you're driving to work or wherever, just... Turn on these sermons. Instead of listening to all the stuff that you can't do anything about, you know, talk, talk radio. If I give them 10 minutes, I'm ready to go to war. You know, I mean, that's just what it does to you. So just turn that off and get into, you know, listening to the preaching of God's Word. And I was listening this week. Dana sent me a, a the pastor's a wonderful pastor. Uh, I can't pronounce it, Lutzer or Lutzer or something, but uh, you can ask her about him. But uh, she sent me this. And I've been listening to several of them she sent, but he was talking about Wycliffe when, uh, or Wycliffe, however you like to say it, John Wycliffe back in the, you know, 13, 1400s. This man said, you know what? People need a Bible. They need a Bible where they can read their own Bible. And, and they burned that man at the stake for that, for translating a Bible. Before the printing press, remember before Gutenberg's printing press, he, they were handwriting these Bibles. Not everybody had a Bible. But he wanted every farmer, every plowboy, you know, to have their own Bible. And he did that, and they burned him for it. In fact, I think it was 100 years later, I may get the timing wrong, but the Catholic Church, some of the men, they dug up his bones, right, because they didn't want him to be resurrected to start doing what he's done again. That's how much they hated this man. Yeah, so, I mean, guys, let me tell you something. Y'all, you know, I know you, 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 you listen, you had to learn to trust your pastors and your elders that God's given you. There is so much that's happened in church history because people didn't know their Bible. And that's why I'm stressing to you. I want you to learn to pick this thing up and read it for yourself. If he can take a dummy like me and, and teach him, he can teach all of you guys, and y'all are a lot smarter than me. There's one. I knew it was coming. Cha-ting, right? All right, so back to 2 Thessalonians 3, and we're going to finish this up. Last week we saw another of God's commands to us Christians. And the deal was, just like today, you don't know when Jesus is going to return, so you stay busy doing what you're supposed to be doing and tend to your own business working for the Lord. Don't expect people to provide for you. He said in that very straightforward, blunt uh, verse, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. And that was a reminder. As I told you, I wanted you, I mean, unbelievers would say that, right? I mean, how many, you, you, you know, you ladies, if you got a man say, ah, I ain't working no more, are you going, oh, well, I'm so happy for you. Like, no, that's the worst thing you could ever hear, right? That, don't, that don't, doesn't, doesn't register with your mind that a man wouldn't work. So we, when we made sure we stressed to you, if, you're will, if he's able to work and willing, then he should be willing to work. He should want to do something to take care of his family. Now, the root of that, what separates us from even unbelievers is that we've learned that our life is not our own anymore. That we are in Christ now. 
And we live to work for the Lord. He took us out of the kingdom of darkness. You don't belong over there anymore. And He placed you in the kingdom of His Son. You're like, you were purchased, right? You were purchased with the precious, precious blood of Christ. He didn't want you to live in the world anymore. And He didn't want you to have that attitude anymore of, I don't care. In other words, the guy that says, I'm not willing to work. Jesus is coming back soon. And I'm just going to sit up here and let Him take care of me. What's He really telling all of you? I don't care about you. I'm going to do what I want to do. And y'all can just take it or leave it. But that's the way the world thinks, right? But as Christians, no, we're what? We're a part of a body. We're part of the body of Christ. That means now we're looking, what, what, what is my part, Lord? What would you have me do? And so we, we learned about that last week. We keep talking often that we're not here to store up treasures. We're not here to make a name for ourselves. We are in this body of Christ, and each of us has a part of that body. And if your part is not functioning as that part of the body is supposed to function, then guess what? It hurts the rest of the body of Christ. And the big deal with this guy who refuses to work, what he's saying is, in, and there may be some here today, if you don't care what you are doing that's hurting the body of Christ, then we got another issue. It's a love issue then. And that is not the love that Jesus put in the heart of his people. Remember the Bible says that he shed abroad his love. Now has anybody ever loved you more than Jesus? But he put his love in our hearts. That's what the Bible says. So if you're walking around and you have, I don't care what nobody thinks, I'm going to do my thing. That's not what Jesus did. That's not the love he put in our hearts. Now you're going back to the old man, right? And don't we do that? We, oh man, Lord, I just want to do what makes you happy. I just want to please you, Lord. I want to walk with you. I want to serve. And I want to make you happy. And then five minutes later, we're what? We're back in the flesh. Demanding our rights. I want what I want. You know, I want my way. Well, that's not the love that Jesus put in our heart. So we need to understand something very important. And I wanted to stress this day, and it hit me through the week thinking about last sermon, and before I get uh, into this one today, I want you to understand, understand this. This is a promise of God. The Lord Jesus will build His church. There's nothing that can stop that. Okay? Nothing. You choose to get in the flesh and do your own thing, that ain't going to stop the church. Okay? It's going to be built. And it's going to go and accomplish all that the Lord intended for it to accomplish. But there's some things that's going to happen to you if you decide to go that way. But we need to be confident that the Lord's going to build His church. We need to also be confident that His sheep will follow His voice. They will. That's what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They won't listen to the voice of strangers. Okay? Jesus also said the church will be his witnesses. Nothing can stop the will of God. So the issue with this guy who refuses to work, and telling the church, I don't care, is if you don't care what the church is doing, if you don't care what your part is in the body of Christ, or how much harder that it makes others have to do the work because you've decided that you're just going to do what makes you happy, and to heck with everyone else, and the church is not going to be stopped because you made that choice. I wanted you to hear that today. God is still going to use His church, but that's what you have to ask yourself. You have to stop if that's you, and I know nobody here would, would say that, but if you find yourself there, you have to stop and ask yourself, if the church is going this way, and I'm going that way, who needs to turn around? The church? Does the church need to turn around and follow you? Or do you need to turn around and follow which way the church is going? Because I promise you, one day you're going to face Jesus and you're going to give an account of what you did. That's coming. No man escapes that. That's coming. All right, so with that in mind, we're going to wrap up the final few verses here. And he said, uh, back in verse 14, God says through Paul, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually give you peace 
in every circumstance. And the Lord be with you all. The greeting is in my own hand, Paul's, which is a distinguishing mark in every letter. That is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Did, you, did anybody feel a certain, uh, a little bit of an emotion there that, man, that, that's a personal letter written to you, the church, straight from the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you sense that? Did you like Jesus is talking to us here? This is straight from the same man that they hung on a cross. His is told Paul what to write to you, and we just read that, and that's the end of the letter. You know, it makes me want to like, oh my goodness! Every time I finish a book, I'm like, that was amazing. And I know I always think, well, you know what? You're the one studying, trying to teach, so maybe I got a little more out of it this time. But that's why I'm telling you guys often, whenever you read and study something and you learn something, tell somebody. Because when you tell somebody else, it, I don't know how that works, but it does. It sticks with you better. The teachers, I mean, how many? there's been several of you in here that are teachers, and you know that, right? You remember some of the things. Now, I know right now for the next two months, you don't remember nothing. Like, all you teachers get a break. Like, you get, a, you get to turn the brain off for a little bit, except for your Bible teaching. You don't get to turn that off, right? You can teach science and math and all that other stuff. You can get a break from that. So, there's the passage. Let's go back and look at verse 14. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will, put, he will be put to shame. Now, why would God say something like that? Doesn't that seem very unloving and unkind? How would you feel if you come into church and you pass? I just stood up and said, hey, guys, listen. Uh, Y'all know Brother Presley? Y'all know Brother Presley Austin over there? Well, let me tell you something. He ain't been working very hard this week, so I want y'all to avoid him. I don't want you to even look at him today. Just stay away from him. Shun him. Or y'all are like, what? They, how many of you would be happy to do it? Carrie, don't raise your hand. It don't, it don't sound right, does it? Like, God, why would you say such a thing? That's harsh. But first he says here, in, the, in that, first that verse, if anyone does not obey our instruction, then we've been talking about this several lessons, instructions, these words, commands, orders, okay? We keep learning that over and over again. What are we learning? This is what happens when you become a Christian. You obey. You obey what? The Lord's orders, the Lord's commands. You don't hear it and say, uh, the Lord Jesus commanded you to do this. Ah, eh, I'm good, Lord. I got my thing going. I'll do. Hey, Lord, uh, you do you, and I'll do me. They don't work that way, okay? As my daddy said, you've heard me say, that dog won't hunt. So what do Christians do? They obey the Lord's commands. The apostles are only giving us here through the Scripture what Jesus commanded, and our job is to keep teaching people all over the all over the world what Jesus commanded. That's the Great Commission, right? He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them all that I have commanded you. That's your job. It doesn't say it's just my job, right? That's your job. You should be able to go home and say, Lord, I have taught somebody what you commanded. Another word you'll hear, admonish, exhort. Okay? That's different words for the same thing. I have taught them. I have reminded them. I have... I have opened up my mouth and said, hey, you ought to not do that. Uh, this month that the nation wants to call the pride month, you have to open your mouth, church, and say, first of all, God is against everything you're standing for, including the pride, the word pride, right? This is not something that Christians say, well, listen, I want you guys to know that we love you and we're going to march with you. No. That's not, that's not what you're doing. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be teaching them what Jesus commanded. And what did Jesus say about sexual immorality? He said, repent, turn from it, right? Now, you don't use this. Now, I've taught you this often. There's a lot of people in church getting confused. You think you've got this big old heart and you're just going to, well, you know what? The church don't understand you, but I do. How dare you to throw the Bible out and tell them, you just listen to me. I love you. Let me tell you what your love will get for them. It won't get them out of this, out that door right there. Your love cannot save their eternal soul. 
They need the gospel. They need the truth. And they need to repent from their sin and turn and follow Christ. And you can tell any of the alphabet group out there, listen to me, you can promise them if you will turn and repent of your sin and confess Jesus as Lord, he will wipe all of that away. And you can start today a whole brand new person. I like what uh, you know we heard earlier. I mean, it can happen. We didn't hear that here. I heard it on, on one of my little reels. The little preacher was talking about a, a transvestite that he began to share with. A transvestite came into their church dressed to the, you know, just playing the part. And the person came up to him after church and said, Pastor, I just wanted you to know I didn't agree with anything you said today. Nothing. But I have to tell you this. I've never felt more love in my whole life. See, they come in, and so the pastor began to work with him, work with him, work with him. Finally, guess what? He believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. He throws all that other stuff away, and now he's walking as a new person in Christ. So you can do that. You can be a part of that. Don't meet people. We don't meet people at the door and start examining them. Right? We don't do that. We want them to come in. I don't care where they've been. You heard me say that in our prayer earlier. So before I chase that rabbit too far, I just wanted to kind of plant that seed there that you guys are operating under the Lord's command. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit when the Spirit's saying, talk to that person. Do it. Trust me. Even if you don't know what to say, just say something. All right, say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'd like to talk to you, you know. If you need help, call me. I'll help you. There's been many of you, even while we're working, Facebook Messenger can be a wonderful thing. And I'll message back with you, okay? And we'll help each other reach that person. So he's saying here, if there's any in the church who are showing this disobedient attitude, as if they don't care about the church and what the Lord has commanded them, then he wants you to take a special note of that person. And he clearly says, do not associate with them and we've seen this many times in scripture before okay this is nothing new it's ain't just paul saying it one time watch this look on the screen of god telling us to avoid certain people who are we supposed to avoid who are we supposed to shun who are we supposed to stay away from and we're like i didn't know jesus i didn't know church was like that i didn't know the bible said that well look on the screen in first corinthians 5 there's a man who's been sleeping with his father's wife and the whole church knows about it and they're all just staying out of it. Nobody's saying nothing to this young man. Well, Paul says, you know, he's like, hey, I'll take care of it. Don't make me come down there. And here's what he tells them. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a violer or a drunkard or a swindler not even to eat with such a one watch this for what have i to do with judging outsiders do you not judge those who are within the church like that's a rhetorical question i've taught you and taught you and taught you and he's like do you not judge those who are in the church of course you do that's what happens in the church you're, you're supposed to make sure that the church is holy and above reproach and that we're presenting uh, the body of Christ blameless to the Lord on that day when he returns. That's what we do in the church. When somebody comes to you and wants to correct you over sin or talk to you about sin, you should hug their neck. Thank you for loving me enough to tell me the truth because I sure don't want to deal with God on it. I'd rather deal with, you know, I want to take care of that now. So that's what he says. Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. That man, he's tell, that man that y'all are ignoring, he said, remove him. Get him out of there. All right? Then we look on, look on the screen. I'm going to give you another one. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. That's why we tell people, don't marry someone who is an unbeliever. It will never work out. You're going this way and they're going that way. Okay? It ain't going to work. He says, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, Come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. 
and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And I don't know about you, but that makes me really happy to know that I'm a son of God, that I belong to Him. Let me tell you something. The unbelievers, the unsaved, they're not the children of God. Everybody wants to say, well, we're all God's children. No, they're not. When you're born again, John tells us that, right? Then he, then he gave you the right to become sons of God. But not until you're born again. They're not the children of God. Now I want you to think about this person. This person we've been talking about refuses to work. He doesn't care about the church. He understands because we know he's a believer. We've been told that this guy's a believer, okay? And he understands because he's a believer what Jesus did on the cross for him. But he don't mind living in opposition to what Jesus commanded. It's okay with him. I want you to think about what Jesus said about that. In Matthew 12, 30. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Do you see how you, if you're making a decision, you know what, I'm, I'm all about me right now, God. I only got a short time here on this earth and I want to do what I want to do. You're scattering. If you're not, you're not with him. Because that's not what he's commanded you to do. In, in fact, he has clearly said, as I've said last week and this week, your life is not your own anymore. I love the song choice today. You know, Jesus, you are my king. You are my king. Can you imagine if you lived in a monarchy system and you had a king and you said, uh, king, I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that today. And the king, with his head, right? I mean, that's what they did. You don't just tell a king no. You don't tell Jesus no, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm scared, I'm afraid, or what about this, what about that? Or, I, you know, I've got this opportunity. I don't, he don't care about none of that. All he cares about is Jesus looks, and you take this little small group here, and he has purposely worked in all of your lives. Way back. Way back. I was telling a man the other week about, you know, one of the neat things my mom told me a, a few years ago. I had no idea. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a famous uh, preacher from England. And a lot of people that study, you know, uh, you know, church history and things like that would know the name Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's kind of like knowing Dr. John MacArthur. You know, he's a big name. Or Charles Spurgeon. You know, you know some of these names. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, when my daddy was in the Air Force, we were in Upper Hayford, England, at a little church over there. And the pastor's name was R.T. Kendall. And R.T. Kendall knew Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he invited him to preach a revival at the little church there where my mom and dad were going while we were in the Air Force over there in England. And Mama, I was coming home, I was sitting there at Mama's table, and I was telling her about this English preacher I'd been listening to, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. She goes, oh, I remember him. And I'm like, what do you mean remember him? Well, he preached a revival at Upper Hayford. You know, moms don't forget nothing. Did y'all know that? I mean, this is 1975 or 76, okay? Because my brother's born over there in 75. So I think it was 75, and he's preaching a revival. And she said, oh, yeah, he held you when you was a baby. I was touched by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. but I, and, and that's funny. People love to hear it. But let me tell you what hit my mind, being a pastor now. Because when I hold your babies, when I touch your babies, let me tell you what. I've, I've said this before. I pray for them right then. I think about them often when I'm up here preaching about what Destiny's doing back there, you know, with the babies. You know, hope, pray, Lord, please don't let her whip them. And get some mama mad at her, you know, and they leave the church over. But no, I, I always think about those babies, and, and as I'm holding like, Lord, use them. Use this child. Put a, put a hedge of protection around them right now. Use their mom and dad to train them right. And, and Lord, I, I, I think about, you know, maybe one of them, I was just telling some of the ladies, uh, you know, was looking at... Uh, Terry and them's little grandson, and I was like, can you imagine him growing up in this church and all of a sudden he's in this pulpit one day? What a blessing that would be. What a blessing, right? To know he grew up here, and now he's shepherding your grandchildren and your children, you know. I mean, what a blessing that would be. You never know how God's working, but God's been working through all of these people's lives. And he's been, and he knows what he's doing. So a person that knows that, he knows what Jesus has done, he knows what Jesus has commanded, but yet he still decides, I'm going to do my own thing? That don't sound right, does it? You know, we got to remember, Christian, we're a whole new creation. We're a people that we stand and say, you know what? I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Can you say that while you're walking the same, a different path? No. 
you know what, Christian? We've decided to deny ourselves and take up the cross and follow Him. Have you ever had to deny yourself yet for the sake of Christ? Have you ever had this wonderful opportunity sitting right there in front of you? And you had to say, I can't take it. I can't take it because it makes me scatter. It makes me go a different way from where Christ is leading me to go. I've told you the story about where I was going to, I had the job offered to me to take care of the Titans field, you know, because I was a golf course superintendent. So they needed that. They needed somebody who could make that grass look like they do on the putting greens and stuff when you go play golf. And that was just like, you know, it would have been a cake job for me. It would have been a retirement job for me. And I'm hanging out with all the big Titans players. And I thought, well, my kids will love this. They'll love getting to hang out with all these Titans players. We get backstage stuff, you know. But I asked the guy, I said, well, how many, how many uh, Sundays have I got to be there? And he said, it's like 13 or something, something, you know. And I got to thinking, man, where we were at in the church at that time, that wasn't going to work. That wasn't going to work. I, and he actually, he's a deacon in his church, Terry. And he told me, he said, Derek, I'm telling you right now, um, it's going to be a problem for you. He said, I'll give you the job, but it's going to be a problem for you. And I'm so thankful that I made that choice. You know what? I'm so thankful. So thankful because doing this right here has been the greatest joy of my life. Ooh, I didn't think it was going to happen today. But I, I do. I love the church, and I want you guys to love the church. I mean, don't you see what the world is doing? The world's falling plum apart. Why do you want to be a part of that system? This is not going to fall apart. When I tell you in the beginning, he will build his church. You know, we're going to have to reorganize and redo some things around here, I think, in our country with the church. I remember going through the COVID stuff, and I was thinking, you know what, God, don't you have some Christian doctors out there? Why, why don't we just all pull all these billions of dollars the church has got together, and we'll start getting our own doctors and our own hospitals that'll tell us the truth. It don't matter who's, the, who's running for office. They're not going to deal... They don't care nothing about that. They're going to look at our bodies and say, hey, you need this or you don't need that. That's the kind of doctor I want. I don't care who he votes for. And I'm not into that. Why, why can't the church come together on these things? So God is saying to us here, that kind of person, though, that born-again Christian, but don't care about the rest of the church and the cause of Christ. He's saying here, guys, when he tells you to shame them, he said they should be ashamed. I told you a few weeks ago, that's a word we don't hear anymore, do we? Oh, no, that's, oh, how dare you say such a thing. I got shamed a lot. Has anybody else ever been shamed? Shame on you, right? We need to hear that more often. Shame on me. The person is breaking the unity in the church, and that is of utmost importance to Jesus. Remember John 17 prayer, Father, I pray that they be one as you and I are one. He wants the unity in the church and the body of Christ. Don't do anything to break the unity in the church. Now, the purpose of this shaming or disfellowship, I want you to get this clearly. It's not just to get rid of them. Okay? Some people, it's easy for you to just get rid of people. I don't like them. I'm done with them. It ha Watch what social media has done. Facebook world, I lost a lot of people I thought loved me. And all I did was speak this. And I didn't even speak to stuff that's like, well, you know, I mean, whether we foot wash or not. I didn't get into none of that. I'm just talking about basic key essential Christian doctrine, and they hate me now. And I was with them my whole life. I don't understand. I don't have that kind of hate for anybody. And that's because God has done a work in me, and I know he's doing it in you too. And, and we should be uh, concerned about the rest of the church. And so God's using to, he says, I don't want you to hate this person, right? He wants to make sure that they know this, that their behavior is not acceptable. And at the same time, God, here God tells us, don't treat him, though, as an enemy. Look back at your verse. He says, don't treat him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay? Now, when you're born again, you're no longer an enemy of God. So when he's calling this guy brother, you look around this church, these people that are born again, Remember what I said? They belong to God. They're a child of God. And you need to treat them like they belong to God. You need to remember they're your brother. Okay? And that person, it has peace with God. If When you get born again, you're not an enemy of God anymore. You're, a, you're at peace with God. That's what Romans tells us, right? Before you get born again, you are an enemy of God. And the only reason you're not in hell right now is because he's just decided not to let you fall through his hand yet. He's holding you up. Go read Jonathan Edwards' great 
sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So this person that you're dealing with, that, that's gone off the, he's gone off on his own and he's acting unruly and disobedient and all of that, he is your brother. So he don't want you to treat him as an enemy. This person is sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. I guarantee you this, there's conviction on his heart. I promise you that. If you're a child of God and you're not doing right, you can't escape the conviction. And if you have no conviction over doing wrong in God's eyes, you ain't got the Spirit. The Spirit will convict you, and you're going to deal with that conviction. But if this guy had the Spirit, he's sealed with the Spirit. And guys, you can't lose the Holy Spirit. That's why he chose to use the word sealed. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, the Bible says. You can't lose your salvation. That is unbiblical. No one will show you in the Scripture where you can lose your salvation. Nobody. And when they go to Hebrews 6, because that's what they're going to do, and if you're listening out there, Hebrews 6 is not talking to Christians because he never told the church to do ceremonial washings. He's talking to Jewish people who are still wanting to hang on to Judaism and not accept that, it's, that, we be, that we're saved by grace. They still think they got to do something to earn their salvation. That's why Nicodemus come to Jesus in the garden because he knew something was missing. And then, you know, what about all my good works is what he's thinking. Jesus, I'm the teacher of Israel. I've done everything right. What about me? And Jesus said, nope. you got to be born again, Nicodemus. Well, how am I supposed to be born again? I can't go back into my mother. No, you can't born yourself again, Nicodemus. It's the Spirit that gives life, and you don't know where it's coming from or where it may happen to you today. You're sitting here in a chair in National City, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God gets a hold of your heart and says, you are not right with me, and all you got to do is confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, and you will be saved today. You don't have to go to seminary or sit in church for 345 days straight. You don't have to do any of that. You don't even have to come to this building. You just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved today. But you got to confess it with your mouth and believe in your heart. You not well, you won't be ashamed of it. You won't be ashamed to stand and say, "Hey, I." That's why we do baptisms out publicly, okay? So that you're telling people, "I identify with the body of Christ. I have been saved, and I want you to know I'm a part of the body of Christ." And then when you do that, there's a certain expectation we have of you when you join the church, when you join the body of Christ. Here's a certain role that God has prescribed to you. There's a certain responsibility you have. So if you decide to just keep doing your own thing, you're disobedient, he says, get away from that person. Shun them. Make them feel that, uh, that shame so that it hurts their heart so bad that they come running back to the church wanting to be a part of it. Okay? Now, you've got to deal with this person, guys, with love in your heart. Your goal is to restore him to fellowship with the body of Christ. He's your brother. Your goal is not to kick him out, it's to bring him back in. That's all you're ever trying to do is bring them in, bring them in. And when they come in, maybe they've wandered. You ever wandered? Yeah. We've wandered from the Lord, hadn't we? And when we come back in, do you want somebody sitting there? What have you been doing? No, you know what I like? I like somebody like Lee, that big old smile Lee's got. And he don't care where I've been. He's like, I love you. Big old hug. That's what you want, ain't it? Love the old song. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus. But tomorrow may never be mine. Just give me the strength, right? One day at a time. I love this one. Hey, yesterday's gone. This guy's your brother. Look on the string, Galatians 6. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I'm going to give you, hey, I just ordered me a set of golf clubs. I've never bought any golf clubs. I've been playing the same set for 32 years. My wife has convinced me and others just thought, you know what, it's time. Get you some new golf clubs. Lord's bless, so I ordered them. But guess what the devil's trying to tempt me to do? Because I promise you so. I ain't, and this sounds awful to say it. But, it, uh, Lord, why, why do you make me be so honest? But I'm playing good golf. You can ask Brother Scott, you know. 
I'm playing good golf. I shot a 73 yesterday, you know. So you know what the Lord's tempting me to do? You could get on the senior tour. Man, you're, you're 50 here in just a few weeks. July the 3rd, I turned 50. Th- th- what did I say? No, no, the Lord doesn't tempt you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chad. The devil's, I think that, you know, he's trying to tempt me. You could get on the senior tour. Hey, and if you get on the senior tour, look how much money you can make. But guess when, guess when the senior tour plays? So until I can convince the PGA Tour of America to finish their tournaments on Saturday, I ain't going to be able to go. And so you know what I have to learn to do? I was telling Scott this. We were playing golf this week. I said, I've got to learn to be content. Look, I'm just playing with my brothers in Christ here, having a good time, you know, making some good shots, making some bad shots, you know, and we go home, and, 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 uh, and it's just enough. It's enough, okay? I've got to learn to realize it's enough because I know what would happen to me. If I was to step down from doing this to go playing, my back will be out the first season. So it's easy in the flesh to be done with somebody. Just move on. Treat them as an enemy. He says, don't do that. That's not what God commands us to do with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't browbeat them over it. Guys, this is not a performance-based thing here, okay? We're not here because this is what will happen. It's happened in many churches. They start keeping count of how many times you've been at church. They start keeping up with how much you give. I remember church one time, you know, somebody was telling me they went to church and they wanted them to tell them exactly how much you're going to give to this church this year. You know, it's a performance-based system. We call it legalism. We're not, that ain't what this is about. We're not keeping a tally. When I was growing up, we had the little gold stars for Sunday school attendance. And I don't know, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I'm saying it can be. If you start thinking, you know what, I'm at church every time the doors are open. I give money every single week. But you've never spoken to anybody. You show no love for anybody. What good was all of that? You've wasted your whole time. So we get the right mindset. Here's what he's saying. My mind always goes to Jesus in the first sermon that he ever gave to the large crowds. The Sermon on the Mount, we call it. Matthew 5 through Matthew 7. And look on the screen. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? That's what happens to the guy who goes off on his own, does his own thing. He's tasteless. You're not, you're not doing anything. You're not helping the cause of Christ. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. He says, but you, or look at this church, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Don't you want people around you to see what God can do in their lives? Don't you want them to see that? All right, look at the next verse. Verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. And the Lord be with you all. I want you to be clear today. If you're listening out there and you don't know Jesus Christ yet, you're not a born-again Christian, I want you to know only Jesus can give you true peace. Nothing else. You do not know peace that I'm talking about until you're born again. You will never know it. You are only going to know temporary satisfactions. You're only going to know temporary a calming effect or rest or a temporary happiness. But those things don't last. They never last. Paul knows these people at Thessalonica are being persecuted for, for their faith in Jesus Christ. And he, and he knows that they're all wondering, when is Jesus coming back? We thought it was going to be any day, but it hasn't happened. And you're sitting here today, 2,000 years later, and you're thinking, when is Jesus coming back? We're still waiting for him. Many in the church today think they have peace. You may be sitting here today and you think, Woo, I got a nice house, I got a nice car, got them new golf clubs, new hobbies, got a new job, bank account's looking pretty good, had some nice trips this year coming up. Grandkids' activities, boy, I'm just as happy as a pig in slop. We can go on and on and on with the things. That's not in my notes. I just popped in my head. That's pretty cool. We can go on and on with the things that bring us joy. But all of those things change, don't they? All those things change. They fade away. They break down. They need repair. All these things that the world gives you, they don't last. And you're going to be dissatisfied again over and over with something every single day. 
So God knows here that we need the Lord every day. Amen? We need Him every day. What do we really need from Him every day? His peace. Remember that word content. I want you to take that home this afternoon. Be content with what you got. Lord, I, I wish I had this, this, and this. But I'm going to trust you, Lord, that you got something better for me. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Have you seen that happen to you? I mean, if you've ever been so angry or so scared or so frustrated or so worried, whatever word you want to use, but then all of a sudden, maybe you talk to another Christian. And I'll tell you, if you talk to me, a lot of times I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you that, you know, trust in the Lord. Just turn to Him. Walk His way. Don't go that way, right? He will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He will give you that peace. Every time we see these new changes going on and people's lives and they start what they start doing as I said earlier they start looking at the devil's playground they start looking at the devil's playground and it looks more fun than our playground my playground's kind of boring I mean not mine I think my playground's pretty cool but I'm just saying that that's what some people are saying my playground don't look so fun I want to go try this I want to go try that if I had this I'd be happy if I had that I'd be happy and I can promise you something if you lean on your own understanding, you will never understand that word contentment. You will never desire for the Lord to guard your heart. And that's what you need to pray. Lord, guard my heart. And then look at verse 17. Paul says, I write this greeting with my own hand. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. Paul made sure this time they knew this letter was from him. We studied that earlier in the beginning of this letter. Somebody was coming along saying, you know, we've got a letter from Paul. We've got a letter from Paul or a message from Paul. No, they didn't. They were liars. And so Paul says, i got to do something. So he makes, he makes this uh, uh, in his letters from here on out. He makes sure he writes so that everybody there knew that this letter come from Paul. Okay? He comforts them and he's comforting us today to prove that these letters ex are exactly what Jesus sent to us. In fact, you need to know that. The Bible that you have today is exactly what God sent to us. Anytime someone tries to tell you, well, we don't have the original word of God, you just ignore them. They don't know what they're talking about. Trust me. We do have the original autograph of God. Now, if you want to dive into that, the canonicity of Scripture and how we know our, our, then it's there. It'll blow you away with the information that we have. We have the word of God. And when people try to tell you, no, you don't, then what they're doing, they're doing just like the people back then. There's something in this Bible that they don't like, okay? And they don't want you to tell them about it. That's what it is. Now look at the last verse, and we'll close. Verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You've heard that old saying all your life, save the best for last. That's what I thought here. Save the best for last. Here it is. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. I can tell you honestly, we're nothing without His grace working in us and through us. We're nothing. His grace is a gift. God's goodness, that's what His grace is, God's goodness. And He gives it to people who don't deserve it. Isn't that amazing? He just gives you His grace and you don't deserve it. And I thought it'd be fitting today to close with a, an old song my mother taught me as a child. I'm going to tell you parents something. One day for your children to rise up and say, thank you for teaching me about Jesus. Thank you for taking me to church. Thank you for telling me the truth. That'll bless your heart. And my mother did that. She used to sing all the time, taught us this old song, and we sang it a bunch. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. And here I am, Mama, this, he's still working on me. Right? What would we do without the grace of God working in our lives? Let's pray. Father, you've been so, so good to us. From the beginning that you took this old dead sinner all these dead, wretched, wicked sinners. Lord, we didn't even realize how bad we were yet. In fact, many people are walking along today thinking they're good people. They don't hurt anybody. They obey the law. They 
tend to their own business and they think they're good, but they don't understand that you're talking about a perfection. That they can't be in your presence until they're perfect. No sin. And then when they hear that, they don't know what to do. And that's when we get to tell them, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then God puts His perfection on you, and now you can be right with God. You did that to us. You made us right with you through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. That's the only reason that we're anything. It's because of Him. Lord, help us today to remember as we drift in this world, as we start looking at the devil's playground and thinking there's things that are better out there, Lord, forgive us for that. Help us to learn, and especially like today, when we get to sit around with the church and eat a meal together, I pray that each person here would just, as they're fellowshipping and talking and laughing and eating, that they just look around the room and just see what you've done. To see the joy in these people's hearts that you put there. The love in their hearts that you put there. I pray that nobody leaves this church building without feeling the love of the body of Christ. Father, if there's anyone here today, who is this person that we studied about? Who has chosen to do their own thing? Father, I pray that you'd convict their hearts. Show them what they're missing. Show them that the world, what they think that they're after, it's not going to give them the satisfaction that they want. All they're going to do is look back and regret. So, Father, I pray that each person here would continue to move forward, growing in grace and knowledge, and learning to do their part in the body of Christ. So that one day when we meet you, and we will meet you face to face, there's going to be a big smile on our face. And everything that we did won't be burnt up. It won't be a waste. It'd be something we're proud of. I pray this for every person here, Lord. And if there's someone here today, and they think, you know what, I'm not a Christian, but I want to be. Do not let them leave this building without talking to you, Lord. Please, let today be the day that they receive Christ. And walk forward as a whole new person. And they'll know that joy and that peace I've been talking about. I pray that for them today. In Jesus' name.